Since this is a conference about branding, I should tell you that um, I appreciate that lovely introduction. You, you referred to me as the president and CEO of National Public Radio. Well, we actually now call ourselves, we don't call ourselves National Public Radio anymore, just NPR, which um, for reasons that hopefully will become, that if they're not already evident, hopefully will become evident as I speak to you today. Nothing against radio. We love radio, but we're, we're, we're more than radio um, in the same way that CNN has, you know, no longer cable news network and BBC, British Broadcasting Company? <laughs> Not even sure, a corporation. Anyway, um, I, I have an apology to make before I start because um, I'm planning to spend a couple of, me of minutes really, really, really depressing you. But I just hold on because I promise after I depress you, I will try to cheer you up. So here's the depressing part. I'm going to read some statistics to you. Uh, number one. All of this is recent data. 1.6 billion, with a B, has been lost in 10 years in reporting and digital capacity in the news business. Almost 30% of the capacity in the news business is gone. In the last two years, we have lost in this country more than 30,000 newsroom jobs at newspapers. In the last two years, U.S. Metropolitan Dailies that have, uh, have closed in Denver, Baltimore, and Albuquerque, and the cities that have no daily newspapers whatsoever, print newspapers, Ann Arbor, Tucson, and Madison. Viewership for local television news has fallen 12% in the last few years. Just recently, you may have seen it, ABC News announced that they were reducing their ranks by a third. CBS News has just laid off another 100 journalists, even the BBC is cutting. According to the recent uh, PEJ uh, uh, State of the News Media report, 71% of respondents to a survey feel that, new, that most news sources are biased and 70% feel overwhelmed, say they feel overwhelmed rather than informed. The number of newspaper reporters covering state capitals is half of what it was five years ago. A large share of reporting of local government, economic activity, and quality of life has simply disappeared. And in contemplating all these statistics, I offer up this quote from David Simon, who you, depending on um, who you are, you will either know as the creator of HBO's The Wire or a uh, former reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and he said, the next 10 to 15 years in this country are going to be a halcyon era for state and local political corruption, which is pretty, I told you I was going to depress you, but it doesn't have to be that way. And um, now's the part where I'm going to begin to cheer you up, or I'm going to try anyway, because I believe that what we are looking at now is not the death of news, but it is in fact a revolution in the business model for news. And it's going to take a while for things to shake out but we have to stop looking back and just relentlessly deal with this reality. Shimon Peres says, if a problem has no solution, it may not be a problem, but a fact that must be coped with. Um, or as um, my second favorite media guru, because my first is Jeff Jarvis sitting over here in the room, said, less grandiosely, things are gonna get weirder before they get saner. And because you know what, as, things, as bad as things sound, there is actually uh, opportunity in chaos. And I'm an optimist by nature, and I, I like to look at the bright side. And I do strongly be believe that the wholesale dislocation of the news business that we're undergoing right now gives us license to do things in a new way. And so that's what I want to talk about today, that public media, public media may have many not all, I don't have that much hubris, not yet, but may have many of the answers to the growing information void that those statistics so painfully describe. And it may be, you know, why is that? Well, it may be that those of us operating at, without a safety net feel, take, can take the liberty to break new ground, or that those of us that are unencumbered, as we are in public media for nostalgia for once very lucrative business models that our friends in newspaper and commercial broadcast have enjoyed for so, so many years, uh, well, like I said, we are un, unencumbered. But in order to really see and understand the potential power of public media, 
I, I want to try to dispel a couple of myths because uh, there are many myths out there. It's, it's getting almost as bad as the mythology around healthcare. So, you know, what are the equivalent of our death panels? Um, well, first of all, myth number one, that public media, public broadcasting as you know it, is no longer necessary. Needed it once upon a time, now there's so many north sources, who needs it anymore? Well, to answer that or to refute that, I'd, I'd say let's just take a quick look back um, to the late 60s when, um, when public broadcasting was formed. And at that time, the high costs associated with TV and radio were driving commercial broadcasters away from public service. It was an expensive endeavor they were into, and, and so public broadcasting was established in large part to fill that gap. And as the 1977 um, Carnegie Commission observed, still in the early days of public broadcasting, commercial broadcasting entire output is defined by an imperative need to reach mass audience in order to sell products. And it might be added, satisfy shareholders by returning healthy margins. Now, this is not to denigrate the role of commercial media. I spent many, a couple of very happy decades in commercial media at the New York Times, at Discovery, at CNN. Um, but in, and in those early years, in fact, the news operations of the big three commercial broadcasters were deeper and more expert, even after public broadcasting was formed, than anything public broadcasting would offer for years. But there's no question that a certain kind of content was more likely to flourish, is more likely to flourish in a commercial environment, and that those might not fully satisfy the news and information needs of our diverse nation. So let's fast forward to today. Okay, here we are. Technology has lowered the barrier to entry. Costs are dramatically reduced. So you might say, well, if everybody can be a publisher, why the need for public supportive news? But if you look deeper, that very same technology that has put the uh, proverbial printing press in the hands of everyone means that there are lots and lots and lots of news pages out there. And now we're talking about advertising. That drives down the prices that advertisers are willing to pay, and it makes it harder for any one entity to amass a large enough audience to attract the big bucks. So this unbundling, as we call it, of advertising from content has changed the game and is really, really hurting the commercial news guys, pushing them even further in the direction of programming an audience that earns the highest possible return. For evidence, just look at the opinion mongering that blankets most of not all, but much of cable news. Or the decision of newspaper companies like Bilo or Gannett to install general managers over news operations so the content they produce can be more closely aligned with the needs of advertisers. Or the creation of companies like Demand Media, whose sole purpose is to generate mass audience at the lowest possible cost. The fact is the conditions that created the need for public media are even more present today than they were in the late 60s. The digital transformation that has so disrupted legacy media, media may ultimately yield a more open, transparent, and informed society, but in the, short run, in the short run, there's little reason to think that commercial media alone, whether legacy or startup, will be able to make up for the loss of original reporting that I talked about at the beginning of my remarks. Myth number two that journalism is in crisis. Now, I know I gave you all those depressing statistics, but in fact, it is not journalism that is crisis, but the business model that is in crisis. And many of you probably know and have read, there's just been blanket coverage, because we media love to cover ourselves ad nauseum, um, that uh, the business model, particularly of newspapers, which was largely dual revenue streams of, of display advertising and classified, well, it, well, advertising, both display and classified, and subscription, has really been undermined uh, by, the proliferate, by, the, by the move to digital. Broadcast has uh, a slightly different but, but equally daunting set of issues. And so really the question is, what is the business model that is going to take the place of the business model for media, the media that we know today? And I'll quote Clay Shirky again, which I do a lot. I'm thinking of actually starting a drinking game at media conferences to say every time you hear Clay Shirky's name, you have to take a shot and then We'd all be drunk by the end. But he said, in the end, nothing will work, but everything might. Now, at NPR, we've sort of embraced that little bit of everything, and that's always been our, our, our business model. We, we are do like run like a business. We're a public service. We don't satisfy shareholders. We satisfy audiences. But we do run like a business. And our, this, our diversified revenue stream is now working in our favor. Um, 
if you look at our various revenue streams, it's sponsorship. A lot of advertisers who um, advertise on commercial media are attracted to NPR. It's what, um, it's, it's what you heard about just a, a little bit earlier. They're attracted to the brand, they're attracted to the audience, they're attracted to the uncluttered environment. Membership is up. You know, if you call all those pledge drives that you hear from your local um, station, um, people are responding. Even in the difficult media climate, we have seen record membership of people calling up and saying, I'll give you what I can, you're that important, even if it's only $5. Foundation support is up. In fact, new foundations are going to, there's been several foundations that have supported journalism for a long time um, and, and have supported NPR, like Ford, Knight Foundation, McCarthy, Carnegie, Pew, but now they're being joined by um, the Open Society Institute, Gates, Atlantic Philanthropies, and others. And phil philanthropic support from individuals is up, not just at NPR, but in various new public media entities, which I'll talk about in a minute, all over the country. Uh, wealthy individuals are giving back. Warren Hellman has invested in a startup in, in, um, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, John Thornton in Texas. Of course, we were benefited in the early uh, part of um, the last decade by Joan Kroc. So we at NPR are not dependent on the fate of any single source of revenue. So if one is down, as it was last year when sponsorship was down, we're wounded but not killed. And the other interesting thing about um, our content is that as we venture, part of the problem that, that, that's happened with newspaper and, and, and television um, entities is as they move, you know, the, the previous speaker was talking about the, you know, the print dollars, or you could say legacy media dollars and digital dimes, and as they move from one platform to another, that revenue is quite literally, I use the word decimated. But in fact, for us, we're finding that um, our presence on new devices is not so much supplanting our traditional audience as extending our reach and deepening audience engagement. And so we're seeing that a lot of those revenue sources that I talked about are carrying over to digital platforms. And uh, so it's, it all carries over. We feel more, um, uh, more protected uh, our revenue sources are more protected as we move from platform to platform. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens this Saturday as we launch on the iPad. Um, one revenue stream we haven't talked about, which is U.S. government support. It's very modest by world standards in this country. Um, you know, you may have heard these statistics. Canada spends over $22 per person on public media. England invests over $80 a citizen for public media. In the U.S., it is $1.35. And that doesn't go very far. Um, and in fact, there's a big misperception in public media that we are largely funded by the government. In fact, local stations are funded less than 10%, and NPR, uh, one to 2% of our budget comes in the form of uh, the winnings of competitive grants from the CPB, which is funded by the federal government. Um, but I'm gonna move along because I'm running out of time. Myth number three, that there are fewer and fewer news organizations these days. That is not true. Sure, we talked about some newspapers folding, but the amazing thing is that new news organizations are springing up everywhere, and they're almost all online. There's the Texas Tribune in Austin, there's the Voice of San Diego, there's Min Post in Twin Cities, the Beacon in St. Louis, uh, the Bay Area News Project, or I guess now it's called the Bay Citizen in San Francisco, the uh, Chicago News Cooperative in Chicago, every day I read about another one of these organizations. And the interesting thing is they're almost all staffed, not by um, you know, the, the uh, proverbial blogger in pajamas, not that there's anything wrong with bloggers wearing pajamas, or citizen journalists, they're staffed by you know, uh, refugees or exiles, w willing or unwilling from legacy media. You know, another, um, there's, there's a funny line, there's a, um, a guy who writes about journalism, you, um, named Alan Mutter, and he wrote, you know, one of the problems is that newspapers fired so many journalists and turned them loose to start so many blogs. They should have executed them, he said. They wouldn't have had competition, but they foolishly let them out alive. Which is pretty funny, and that's exactly what's happening. Um, myth number, what myth am I on now? Number five, that serious journalism is one way, that we are authoritarian, and we tell you what's got happening, and maybe we'll let you, you know, write us letters or give us comments. Well, I think just about everybody in this room knows that that's no longer the way of the world. And um, we love embracing our audience. And we have come to the re realization, as most n news organizations, many quality news organizations have, that there is 
no question that no matter what story you are covering, no matter how brilliant a reporter you are, there is somebody out in your audience that knows more about that than you do. And we know that at NPR. We have a really damn smart audience because we hear about them all the time. And I'll tell you one story, one anecdote about um, our engagement with our audience, which is kind of a silly story, but it, it sort of reveals the power so you, of, of, of this kind of engagement with audience. So you remember uh, in the fall, the balloon boy story? Remember this thing with the kid? Was, in the, was he in the balloon? Was he not in the balloon? So anybody, maybe you don't know why. It was a very big story on cable anyway. So, you know, the idea is that it turned out that the father it was a big publicity stunt. He was trying to get on some reality show. But for many hours, cable television was wall-to-wall -wall covering the story of whether this boy was in this balloon or not. It's not really an NPR kind of story. If you listen to NPR, you won't be surprised to hear me say that. But it was a national phenomenon in that millions of people across the country were watching this thing unfold. And, of course, all the news entities were covering it. Everybody's got comments. And the comments were, oh, where's the father? Oh, blah, blah, blah. So we, um, we, didn't, we uh, have a, a, a news blog on our website called The Two Way. And uh, so our news bloggers, you know, in the middle of the day said, hey, this thing, if you're, not, you know, if you're not watching TV, here's what's happening. The world is watching. Here are the facts. We'll, we'll let you know what happens. And we have a comment section. So the comment section, to me, I love this because this epitomizes, to me, the point about the brilliant audience and the power of the kind of information you can get from your audience. So I'm just going to read you, there, there's a long chain of blog, of, of postings on this blog, but I'm just going to read you two entries and, and you'll get the idea. So this is the first comment under this blog. Number one, I don't have his name, they all have, uh, 20, quote, 20 foot diameter, four foot tall, would get you about 77 pounds of lift at sea level, not including the weight of the equipment. Average six-year-old is 45 pounds. Maximum weight of equipment will be 32 pounds, which is light but reasonable if the envelope was very thin mylar. Comment number two. Okay, I'll throw in my two cents. So here are my numbers. Radius of balloon equals 2.5 meter. Average height of balloon equals two meters. Density of air at 5,000 foot Fort Collins equals 1.05. Six kilograms. Anyway, it goes on and on and on, and, and they start arguing with each other. At one point, one of them, you know, the, the postings become a conversation, and one of them says, show your math, which I love. And anyway, at the end of this, I know, it's great. So we're following this whole thing, and these people figured out that uh, before the balloon even landed, that there was no way that that balloon, with its density and thickness of mylar and all this stuff that I don't completely understand, could possibly have kept the weight of that boy up in the balloon. So again, a silly story, but it shows you the power of engaging in your audience as, as a reporting tool, and of course also as a distributor. So now what? So we, we think here at Public Media, for a lot of the reasons that, uh, and at NPR, we, we have the tools, we can step up, we are stepping up, and, um, and we feel we have an obligation. We have an obligation, um, our, first of all, our obligation, first and last in everything we do, is to serve the audience. Um, we are not a for-profit organization. Everything we do is about mission. We feel an obligation to share and to network our content, which is why we're creating a public media platform, so that our content, all public broadcasting, and any of these new public media st startups and other not-for-profits who share our mission, content can be available to each other. We have an obligation to extend our original reporting, and we are. Uh, we have 17 bureaus overseas. We're extending our, our original reporting overseas. We've launched an investigative journalism um, unit for the first time ever, already doing extraordinary work. We're working with stations to do reporting on the local level. And most of all, we have an obligation to both innovate and to spur innovation by putting our content and tools into open source, as I mentioned, so that everyone can get their hands on it, especially all those brilliant coders out there, the public, other publishers, we best fulfill our mission to serve um, American audiences. You know, I'll, I'll just wrap by referring back, I was talking about the Public Broadcasting Act that was, um, that was enacted in the late 60s, and, and in it, Lyndon Johnson, this was in the, in the Johnson administration, and in his speech announcing the creation of this new public broadcasting entity, he said, although interestingly enough, these words were written by Bill Moyers, who was a speechwriter at the time, we must consider new ways, this is 1967, we must consider new ways to build a great network for knowledge, not just a broadcast system, 
but one that employs every means of sending and storing information that the individual can use. And I'd really like to think that Johnson's words, in his words, he anticipated the complex, thrilling, interconnected digital world that we live in today and the role that public media would play in it. So thank you.